Hi, folks. Welcome to the Programmatic Environmental Impact Statement PEIS meeting. We're waiting for folks to log on and join. We're looking forward to talking with you today. We'll give just a couple moments. Um, if you're experiencing any technical difficulties, the email on the screen, um, you can contact Bushra Bangi at um, the email on the screen here. Give it another minute. Still seeing a few folks join. Okay, let's head to the next slide as we uh, begin our welcome today. So again, you're at the draft programmatic environmental impact statement overview um, for Bowen Pacific Regional Office for decommissioning oil and gas. Uh, if we can head to the next slide here, I'll do a quick overview of our Zoom functionality today. Um, again, my name is Jenna Tourget. I'll be the facilitator for today's meeting. Um, we'll have a, we're in Zoom webinar, not Zoom meetings today. So there's a little bit of functionality that we want to talk through. Um, so you shouldn't be able to see a mute or unmute button on your screen. But if you do provide public comment, um, you'll see those appear after you've raised your hand and we mute and unmute you. Um, we will have that opportunity for oral public comment um, at the end of the meeting today during the public comment session. Um, we'll talk through raising your hand if you're on your phone, um, but you can dial star nine. And if you do, if you are a phone call in user and do have um, any technical difficulties today, you can also dial star nine. Uh, the chat at the bottom of the screen is to be used for technical assistance only. Uh, there's closed captioning that's provided. You can click on closed caption um, and have that provided to you as well. Uh, if we can go on to the next slide here. Again, any technical difficulties, you can message technical uh, assistance or the host in the chat feature. And again, if you're a, if you're a phone call in user, you can dial star nine. Next slide. All right, so we have a couple polls with us today. Um, just to get us started, we're so grateful that you're all here. And we do know that with Zoom webinar, um, if you're joining as an attendee, you can't see who else is on the call. And we wanted to just open it up a little bit for folks. Um, so at the top left of your screen, depending on your Zoom, uh, what uh, version of Zoom you have, you should be able to see the number of attendees who are joining throughout. So right now we have about 20 folks on the line with us. We're going to launch two polls. The first poll is, um, we'll launch it now, and it's to see just the affiliation of folks on the call. So uh, the question is, what is your affiliation? And this is the same um, question that was asked when you registered as well. Um, and so the first is tribal indigenous. The second is community-based organizations. The third is academia. The fourth, government then NGO, non-government organizations, um, business industry, press, and other. So we'll just give one moment as folks continue to respond to that. Wonderful. So we can end this poll and share results. It looks like we have a lot of folks here joining us from government agencies folks from business and industry, from NGOs, and then um, academia, community-based organizations, and other as well. So thank you, we can stop sharing, go to our second poll. Okay, our second poll today is just to help us track for the end of the meeting today, how many folks are anticipating providing public comment. We know that more people will join throughout the meeting as well, but just to get a gauge. So whether folks plan on providing comment. All right, we'll give another moment. Okay, it looks like um, folks, there are a few folks who are planning on providing public comment today and we look forward uh, to hearing that public comment. We can head to the next slide. So 
So we're going to have two opportunities to hear from you today. Um, I mentioned the public comment, uh, and then we'll also have a question and answer period today. So that Q&A is for members of the public to ask clarifying questions related to the PEIS process, and BOEM will provide uh, responses to those questions related to the PEIS process. Um, to use uh, the Q&A or to ask a question, you can click on the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen as questions come up. Um, this is open now, so you can ask questions um, as, as the presentation is going and if you have any clarifying questions. There might be questions that you have that are unrelated to the PEIS, and so I do want to note that BOEM will note and um, see that you see your question, but will only be uh, responding to questions related to the environmental scoping process today. So we'll start with question and answer, and then we'll have public comment. Um, the public comment is a formal comment opportunity. It'll um, be an oral public comment, and that will be after the question and answer session today. So those are the two types of um, conversations we'll be having today. We can head to the next slide. Uh, and again, we're here to provide information to the public on the draft PEIS to answer questions, to hear your public comment, and to talk about next steps. I do want to note that the public comment period uh, is anticipated to close on December 12th, and updates will be posted on BOEM's website, and the final draft will be released on March 2023. We can head to the next slide. Our agenda follows our objectives pretty closely. We are in the middle of the facilitator's welcome. Again, I'm Jenna Torje, your facilitator. Uh, we'll get head to introductory remarks and then have a presentation on an overview of BOEM decommissioning draft PEIS, that brief question and answer session, and then our public comment opportunity. We'll close and have next steps as well. When we get to public comment, there'll be a few processes that we'll, we'll be talking through, and I'll, I'll save this to where we get to the end, but if you are providing public comment, you can raise your hand um, during that public comment period, and I'll call in folks in the order that hands are raised. We head to the next slide here. I would like to introduce uh, three folks who will be providing introductory remarks. The first is Rick Yard from the, Bo uh, the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management, BOEM. Bruce Hessen from the Bureau of Safety and Environmental Enforcement, and then Teresa Stevens from the Army Corps of Engineers. So Rick, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Jenna. Uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you for being here uh, to listen in on this meeting about the programmatic EIS for decommissioning in Southern California. The draft is published and out for review and for comment. So that's what we're doing here today. Uh, just wanted to say again, I'm Rick Yard. I'm head of the Office of Environment in BOEM. We are in a support role to the Bureau of Safety and Environmental Enforcement, BESI, who you're going to hear from in just a moment, the Regional Director, Bruce Hessen. Uh, they are the action agency here, they're the decision maker on decommissioning. Uh, BOEM supports BESI uh, in environmental analysis. Uh, so that's what we're doing here today. We want to hear from you. Uh, we're happy you could be here today to get more information about the programmatic EIS, to uh, hear some presentation about the uh, content of the analysis, and to provide us your comments. Our objective in uh, hearing your comments today is so that we can consider those and make appropriate clarifications and revisions to the draft EIS um, to uh, publish a final that incorporates that information that uh, does the best job that we can do to provide a solid foundation for future tiered analyses about uh, decommissioning applications and oil and gas infrastructure in California. So again, welcome. Thank you for your participation. I look forward to hearing more from you all. And with that, I'll turn it back to you, Jenna. Thanks. Great. Thank you so much, Rick. For that opening remark. I'd like, I'd now like to turn it over to Bruce Hessen uh, from BESI. Uh, Bruce, over to you. All right, thanks, thanks, Jenna. Thanks, Rick. Um, on behalf of the Department of Interior's Bureau of Safety and Environmental Enforcement, I'd like to welcome everyone to the second of two public meetings for the programmatic environmental impact statement for decommissioning activities in the Pacific region. 
My name is Bruce Houston. I'm the Regional Director for the Pacific Region of the Bureau of Safety and Environmental Enforcement, which is referred to as BESI. The BESI Pacific Region manages operational safety and enforcement oversight activities, as well as being the Environmental Enforcement Authority on the Outer Continental Shelf along offshore California, Oregon, Washington, and Hawaii. A little background about myself. I'm a 1983 graduate of Texas A&M University with a Bachelor of Science degree in Petroleum Engineering, and I've been a California registered professional engineer since 1997. I have 40 years of oil and gas experience in California and have been with Bessie since May of 2016. I served as the permitting section chief and the regional supervisor of field operations prior to being promoted to my current position in August of this year. The Outer Continental Shelf Lands Act and the implementation of regulations establish decommissioning obligations to which a lessee must commit when they sign an agreement for an offshore lease. This includes the requirement that they apply for and obtain a permit for subsequent removal of their platforms. Thus, he enforces these obligations as well as, as well as other laws and regulations associated with decommissioning of offshore oil and gas platforms and associated facilities in federal waters. Bessie initiated a programmatic EIS for Pacific Region decommissioning activities in Southern California in July of 2021. As Rick said, BOEM is assisting Bessie in the preparation of the environmental analysis with Bessie the decision maker for Pacific Region decommissioning activities. As we prepare for anticipated offshore oil and gas decommissioning in the Pacific Region, this environmental analysis will help provide critical information we need to better inform our decisions on future decommissioning applications. Your feedback is essential to ensure a robust analysis based on sound science, public input, and the best available information. BESI staff will consider all public comments received today and submitted in writing or through the Federal Register. I sincerely thank you all for taking time today to attend this meeting. Your input is very much appreciated. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Bruce, for, uh, for your opening remark there. Um, I'd also now like to turn it over to Teresa Stevens with the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. So Teresa, over to you. Thank you very much. Hi everybody, my name is Teresa Stevens and I am a U.S. Army Corps of Engineers Senior Project Manager. On behalf of the Corps of Engineers, I'd like, you, like to welcome you to this public meeting. The Corps was invited to participate as a cooperating agency for this programmatic EIS and accepted this invitation to address NEPA compliance. While the Corps has no federal permit action for any particular decommissioning project at this time, the programmatic EIS will help inform the per permit process for specific projects in the future. Federal permits qualify as federal actions, therefore the Corps must also comply with NEPA. Due to the nature and scope of activities that may occur in waters of the United States, the Corps has determined future decommissioning actions could result in significant impacts to the aquatic environment. Under our federal permit program, the Corps is responsible for regulating work and structures in waters of the United States which may affect navigation and interstate commerce. Federal actions such as core permit decisions are subject to compliance with a variety of federal environmental laws in addition to NEPA. Consequently, the core has a responsibility to evaluate the environmental impacts that would be caused by proposed projects prior to making a permit decision. In meeting our regulatory responsibility, the Corps is neither a project proponent nor an opponent. In addition to evaluating the direct, indirect, and cumulative environmental impacts of proposed projects, the Corps must determine whether a project is in the public interest. The public interest review requires the Corps objectively evaluate project benefits and balance them against a project's reasonably foreseeable detriments. 
The core public interest determination requires a careful weighing of factors relevant to a particular project. No permit can be granted if the core finds a proposal is contrary to the public interest. The core would like to emphasize that we will accept and carefully consider all comments that are received today and that they will be given full consideration as this programmatic EIS process continues. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Teresa, for those opening remarks. I will now turn it over to Lynette Makua, the NEPA coordinator for the Pacific Regional Office, uh, for an overview of the of decommissioning draft PEIS. So, Lynette, over to you. Thanks, Jenna. Okay, good afternoon. My name is Lynette Makua. I am the NEPA coordinator with GOM, working on in the Office of Environment that's headed by Rick Yard, who you heard from earlier. And BOEM, in collaboration with Argonne National Laboratory, prepared this environmental analysis. This PEIS will provide a foundation for efficient review of forthcoming decommissioning applications. So today I will first provide some background of the area and infrastructure, and then we'll move into a high-level overview of the PEIS. Next slide. Shown here are the current lease areas and platforms. There's oil and gas platforms located near Orange, Los Angeles, Ventura, and Santa Barbara counties. There are no oil and gas platforms offshore Oregon, Washington, or Hawaii federal waters. The OCS, which you'll hear me refer to repeatedly, is the Outer Continental Shelf. The jurisdictional boundary is typically three to 200 nautical miles from the coastline. So in this map, if you look carefully, you can see the California state platforms in blue. And also those are in the shallow depths, as you can see. And then platforms in federal waters of the OCS are at depths of 150 feet to nearly 1200 feet. And those are shown here in red. So I wanna take a second to draw your attention to platform Harmony, which is number three to the left of center here, located in the Santa Barbara West platforms. I will use Harmony as an example in the next few slides. Okay, next slide. Thanks. Here we have a top photo from around 1895 and the bottom photo of the same coastline of about 100 years later to, to illustrate the production facility life cycle. So what is the life cycle of offshore production facilities? They can be simplified into four stages, which is first leasing and exploration, then construction, and then production, which is where we are now heading to the last stage, which is decommissioning. So how is decommissioning different from state versus federal waters? Because we just saw the map of the facilities in both. While the decommissioning process is similar, in state waters, the California Natural Resources Agency is the lead agency consulting with the state resource agencies and operators with decommissioning projects in the state waters must still coordinate with federal entities that have authority in state waters, including the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers and the U.S. Coast Guards. So all projects require coordination with local air pollution control districts and city planning departments. We can go to the next slide, please. Thanks. The first offshore California infrastructure was installed in 1967, and that's Platform Hogan. The newest platform was installed in 18, sorry, 1989, excuse me, which is Platform Heritage. There's eight platforms which are listed here at the bottom of this slide that are in the beginning stages of decommissioning. So on the right, we have a simplified platform diagram. So if you look to the right, you can see the line pointing to the conductors or they're sometimes referred to as wells. The top sides, which you can see the bracket on the upper left, those are the facilities above sea level. And then another significant part of the platform we'll be talking about today is the jacket, which you can see the bottom bracket on the left as well, pointing to the jacket. This is essentially the outer portion from the seafloor uh, to sea level. Okay, we can go to the next slide. For those who have not been on or near a platform, this image of Platform Harmony really helps to emphasize the huge amount of structure that's being undertaken. If you note the blue arrow pointing to 
the man walking, he just looks like a dot. But to show the scale, I think it's important to note these are some of the deepest fixed platforms in the world. Harmony right here is 1,198 feet tall. This is the one located in the Santa Barbara West Channel that we looked at at the map earlier. Harmony is operated by Exxon Mobil Corporation and is the largest jacket in the Pacific OCS. As you could imagine, many of the heavy lift vessels and large barges are not physically located in the US West Coast right now. And there's only a few specialized vessels. These are required to take part of this large removal or the partial removal of these platforms. And so this availability of those vessels is factored into the PEIS impact analysis we're talking about today. There's now a high worldwide demand and less availability of the vessels necessary to conduct these huge lifts. Okay, next slide. Okay, thanks. I want to stress that decommissioning is a complex process. So in 2016, BOEM, Bessie, and the California State Lands Commission chartered an interagency decommissioning working group, or the IDWG. The working group includes federal, state, and local agencies and other authorities involved in permitting. The group's goal is for all to be prepared and coordinated when the operators submit requests to decommission their facilities. So here is the citizen's guide that's pictured on the right. You can find the link below. There's a matrix of responsibilities that's really a helpful resource inside of this guide. And you can find the approvals and actions that are required for each platform. And then lastly, conductor removal has been covered under separate analyses, which were EAs. And those are included in the appendix, which is appendix B and C to the PEIS. Okay, can we move on? Thank you. The National Environmental Policy Act, or NEPA, of 1969 requires federal agencies to evaluate and document the environmental impacts of and the alternatives to federal actions. So this particular PEIS does not approve any decommissioning activities. And there are two different types of environmental impact statements. There's programmatic and then site-specific. The programmatic analysis is a pathway to streamlining the NEPA review. So in this case, while they're not identical, the existing 23 federal platforms share many commonalities, as well as the geographic scope, which is being in the Pacific OCS, and the federal action is the same, which is decommissioning. This PEIS and the analysis does not require consultation or review under the ESA, the MMPA, NH NHPA, and so forth. Bessie will be reviewing each individual decommissioning application as they are received. So that will be taken into consideration the unique characteristics of each at the time. So this also includes essential fish, fish habitat consultations. Those will take place at the future EIS stage. And you may have heard of tiering NEPA documents. Tiering allows for the environmental analysis for each site specific project to be conducted closer in time to the actual decommissioning phase or in this case, it might be when the vessels become available. So the intent of tiering is to eliminate repetitive discussions and focus on the actual issues that are ready for decision. Okay, next. Okay, thanks. This PEIS is necessary to analyze the environmental impacts and the safety risks of the decommissioning process and to inform agency decisions in order to minimize the impacts and conflicts with other users of the OCS. Government agencies use analysis and focus on what did by the government action. The full purpose and need is much longer than what I have on this slide here. There's more details in chapter one. And all EAs and EISs have a purpose and need for those of you who are familiar with the NEPA process. Then I wanted to point out this photo on the right. This is an example of an upper jacket removal uh, for scale. Okay, the next slide. Okay, chapter two in the PEIS walks through alternatives and the proposed action. So in numerical order, these can succinctly be referred to as complete removal, meaning everything comes off the seafloor, partial removal without artificial reefing, 
partial removal with an artificial reef option, and then no action. So decommissioning under any of the three action alternatives would involve three basic phases. That's pre-severance, severance, and disposal. The pre-severance phase would be similar among alternatives one through three, as you're seeing here. The pre-severance activities include on-site mobilization of support vessels and barges, preparation of the target platform for severance, and then also the removal of conductors. Activities associated with the severance phase, those would vary among alternatives one through three, and alternatives two and three would be similar in that they both include the complete topside and conductor removal, but only a partial removal of the platform jackets. The pipelines and cables for those two would be abandoned in place. And abrasive and mechanical cutting is the most likely removal method, which has largely been done. Explosives would be utilized as a contingency plan only and are not expected, but explosive severance is evaluated as three sub-alternatives for each action alternative in the document. And then the last phase, which I mentioned is disposal. Alternative one would have the most onshore disposal and alternative three would have the least onshore disposal with alternative two falling somewhere in between. And then last but not least, our no action, which is alternative four. That means that following the lease termination, all of the wells would have been permanently plugged and abandoned, uh, plugged and the pipelines would be decommissioned. Okay, now alternative two next. Okay. The regulations for alternative two, we have listed on the top right, right here. Alternative two, as a refresher, is the partial removal without an artificial reef. So here, the associated pipelines would be abandoned in place rather than removed like they would for alternative one. Alternative two provides for a wide range of removal, meaning the facilities could be severed at 85 feet below the surface, which meets the Coast Guard requirements, or as far down as the seafloor or anywhere in between. Below the mudline structures, would remain in place for alternative two. This alternative maintains some of the fish and invertebrate habitat that is present on the remaining platform jackets and along the undisturbed seafloor where the pipelines would be abandoned in place. The pipelines would be flushed with flushed of contaminants, filled with seawater, sealed, and then left in place on the seafloor with their ends buried. And then inaccessible obstructions, including shell mounds, if there are any, would remain in place. This is also the same for alternative three, which is the artificial reef option. And then like alternative one, alternative two would also use onshore disposal of platform topsides and of the upper jacket materials. Okay, next slide is alternative three. Thanks. So for our rigs to reef option, an extensive amount of research has been conducted, much of it funded by BOEM that has demonstrated the most productive habitat in the world may be underwater portions on these platforms that form artificial reefs within the Southern California Bight. This research has motivated the state of California to pass legislation to enable consideration of a rigs to reef option, which could preserve some of this productive habitat. Article two of Assembly Bill 2503 addresses partial removal of offshore oil structures Due to public demand, both partial removal alternatives were developed to consider these options besides the default, which is complete removal. And so Bohm and Bessie are in the process of considering these alternatives. Okay, next slide. Thank you. For partial removal, again, that means the jacket structure is severed to a permitted navigational depth and then placed on the seafloor next to the base of the remaining structure or towed elsewhere for deployment. So I wanted to show this diagram for a visual of what that would look like. The 85 feet requirement below the sea level is required by the regulated, regulating agency, which is the US Coast Guard. And that's also required by California's Riggs to Reef Bill. So Bessie, through its Rigs to Reef program, may grant an exception from the requirement to remove a platform or other facilities under certain conditions, 
provided that the structure complies with the National Artificial Reef Plan. The responsible state agency acquires a permit from the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers and accepts title and liability for the structure placed in an artificial reef. It also must satisfy the U.S. Coast Guard navigational requirements that I mentioned and a few more things. But for more information on this, you can visit the section of the document that's the first bullet listed right here. Okay, next slide. Thanks. Here on the left, you can see picture of the picture of platform Gilda, some rock fishes there. And then the right photo has a diver to show the scale next to conductors. So we've already covered the physical area and a little bit of the oil and gas drilling history in the state. So this is also an area of rich diversity in the marine environment. In summer, there's extensive up upwelling in this area. And in addition to the natural habitats present in the intertidal and subtidal zones, the platforms present a unique artificial hard bottom habitat in contrast to the surrounding soft bottom habitats. The platform structure provides attachment sites for sessile invertebrates, such as mussels, corals, bryozoans, and sponges. And it also attracts a variety of mobile invertebrates and fish. There's four sea turtle species that occur here, and this area supports a diverse marine mammal community. Nearby cultural resources onshore include pre-contact and historic archaeological sites, built architectural resources, and traditional cultural properties. So in addition to biological and cultural resource, there is economic information in chapter three that includes population, employment and income statistics, housing, environmental justice, and more. We can move to the next slide, please. Thanks. Moving to impacts. Four impact levels were considered in this analysis. They are negligible, minor, moderate, and major. For the three action alternatives, impacts are no more than moderate overall. Impacts on biological and physical resources are expected to be no more than minor, except for the possible moderate impacts on the marine mammals and fishes with swim bladders. Also temporary moderate impacts expected on water quality, and marine invertebrates and benthic habitat due to the bottom disturbance during severance for the most part. To highlight what a moderate impact means in this analysis, that's when the viability of a resource is not threatened. Although some of the impacts may be irreversible, the affected resource would recover completely if mitigation were applied and once the stressor ceases. Moderate means that the impact to the resource is unavoidable. Then switching gears to socioeconomic resources, minor is common throughout this analysis and minor impacts are defined as adverse impacts that could be avoided with feasible mitigation. There's more sociocultural impact definitions detailed through chapter four. And then for cultural resources, please understand this is very early in the phase of consulting early and often. So we're in the process of conducting cultural resources studies with the intent to identify historic properties, including traditional cultural places and sacred sites. These studies will be consulted on as appropriate through the section 106 process. Our preferred method of mitigation is avoidance. We will continue to engage in consultations in order to best address historic properties as we learn more. Okay, next slide. Okay, moving more into chapter four, this walks through the potential effects of decommissioning activities on the socioeconomic systems, natural and cultural resources. So we identified impact producing factors, the IPFs or stressors for this analysis. Those factors accounted for intensity, the geographic range and the duration of potential effects associated with the specific activities. So to perform evaluations of impacts such as air emissions or socioeconomic impacts, those are measured only on an annual basis, meaning we use the peak year activities from the largest platform, which is platform Harmony, which you remember from the earlier slide photo. 
and up to eight platforms may be decommissioned within the next 10 years or about one per year on average. So the stressors we looked at on the resources or conditions included noise, air emissions, turbidity and sedimentation, seafloor disturbance, lighting, vessel strikes, habitat loss, sanitary wastes and wastewater, visual intrusions, and space use conflicts. So on this slide is noted the table 4.1.1, and this has details about the IPFs if you want to learn more. And then the effects range from minor to moderate, being similar among alternatives one through three, the partial and complete removals. And future NEPA analysis will focus on the site-specific issues and effects related to the removal activities proposed in the individual applications. Table 4.1-2, the one right after this one listed, details the socio-cultural resources and conditions if you're interested in reading more about those. Okay, next slide. Thanks. Under the no action, most impacts are negligible when considering the current condition of and the stresses on the affected resource, as well as the resilience and sustainability of that resource. Overall, we do not expect noticeable cumulative effects on resources potentially impacted by the proposed action when added to past, current, and foreseeable future impacts on these resources from other sources. You are likely aware of future offshore wind development to meet various renewable energy goals. There's also extensive commercial and recreational fishing on the Southern California OCS, as well as aquaculture in coastal waters. And the level of all three of those are reasonably foreseeable to continue and likely increase into the future. The Port of LA and the Port of Long Beach represent two of the largest ports in the United States and annually receive about 4,000 commercial and cruise vessel arrivals, many of which come through the Santa Barbara Channel. Other activities include military space launches and missile testing, launches for civil and commercial space entities like SpaceX. And the mitigations in this document are based on generally accepted oil and gas good practices, and those start in section 4.1.2. Okay, we can move to the next slide. Thanks. BOEM, Bessie, and their predecessor agencies have funded several environmental and technical studies that informed the decommissioning offshore California. Since the late 1990s, nearly 50 studies have been conducted. This study brochure, which you can see here on the left, and the link is located above the sea lion photo, this describes 42 completed studies and four studies that are currently underway. It's organized by discipline, including biological, cultural and archeological, shell mounds and more. So more than half are biological studies that have produced important insights about the distribution, habitat, behavior, and ecology of fish and other marine species, including species that use the oil and gas platforms as their habitats. This suite of studies will inform BOEM's assessment of potential impacts of decommissioning activities to marine organisms and habitats. Okay, next slide. Thank you. So the comments right now are due December 12th, and it has moved from November 28th. You might have seen that date, but for now, we have a December 12th deadline for comment. The agencies are still taking into consideration additional extension requests, but for now, here's what we have. There's three ways to comment. The Federal Register in writing, or you can email Rick, who you heard from at the beginning. And next slide. Thanks. So I hope this helps you navigate the document and where you could focus your best time. So thank you for your attention and thanks for being here today. Great, thank you so much, Lynette, for that presentation. Um, we are gonna move into our question and answer for today, and I see a few questions that have popped up. So I'd like to welcome folks, if there are any questions on the decommissioning process, uh, on the PEIS um, process and environmental process to add those to the Q&A. 
I'll start with one, Lynette, I just heard an answer to. Um, and as a reminder, there might be some questions before we get in, there might be some questions that are um, that you have that are unrelated to the environmental scoping process. So we're going to be answering questions relating relating to the environmental process and other ones will be noted by Boehm and Bessie. So let's start with this question here. Um, there have been several requests for a 45 day comment extension. Have you made the decision about that request? Say, um, thank you. That's a great question and exactly the kind of process question we're looking for. Uh, there have been, I want to acknowledge, there have been at least three comments on the record submitted asking for an extension. Oh, Rick, we lost your audio just for a second. Can you hear me now? Yes. Sorry about that. Not sure what that was. We have received at least three written comments asking for an extension. Um, I'll say Bessie, the Department of Interior, and Bessie and Bohm are considering uh, those requests seriously um, and watch for updates. Here are at least three things that will happen if uh, an extension is granted. There will be a new federal register notice published. There will be a uh, web page update or website will be updated. And the docket where you submit comments will have an update to the comment response deadline. So uh, I will say watch all of those for updates to a potential extension. If there is one, I will hope that it is well in advance of December 12th, so you have time to consider. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Rick, and thank you to the person who asked that question. Okay, uh, our next question here um, is, I think, related to the two alter uh, to the difference between alternatives. So the question is, um, does the lowered jacket potentially represent an artificial reef as well. So Rick, I think I'll, I'll turn that to you. Yeah, this gets right to the way we defined all our alternatives. Uh, so I do want to address this. First of all, I'll say I, I think it might, um, uh, but I will also say great question and we'll be sure to uh, address this in the final to make it clear. Um, I also do want to point out that um, the alternatives have as we have set them up for the document in this programmatic style are intended to represent an entire spectrum. So hopefully we will have addressed in this document, the complete range of environmental impacts that could happen from all of the continuum of partial removal. That's even from the seafloor up to that limit that Lynette described at 85 feet. So that full range of partial removal and the full options for different types of reefing. So the document is intended to cover everything is the short version of all of that, but we'll be sure to try to clarify this and make the document more clear. Thanks. Great, thank you, Rick. And I'll just do a follow-up question. Is a partial removal of a platform not considered an artificial reef? So alternative two. Right, it, the, the, the same answer there. Uh, I understand that it's it's a great question about the technical differences between the two, but we will um, address those as we work on the final to clarify and, and make sure that that adds up to everybody. Thank you. Great, thank you. Um, our next question is, how does a um, Santa Ynez unit sail from ExxonMobil to Sable Offshore change Bessie and Boehm's expectation for um, POCSD commissioning plans and timelines. Bruce, you want to comment on that? Uh, yeah, I'm glad to. Um, it, it, you know, this programmatic EIS is uh, an umbrella for the whole Pacific region for all the de potential de decommissioning uh, projects that will occur. And so uh, the most recent uh, uh, change with ExxonMobil doesn't impact this uh, overall programmatic EIS. Okay, thank you, Bruce, um, for your question here. Um, we, I'm gonna pause for a moment for other questions. Um, Jenna, we, yeah. we have someone who said they submitted a question and when they were- yes. We just, and I, yeah. yeah, so um, someone submitted a question when they registered, will it be answered? Um, so we actually, 
incorporated the answer to that question into the presentation. But um, Rick, would you mind if I just read that question out loud for folks? Great, okay. You. So that question is, um, can you explain under what legal authority, federal regulation or statute can alternative to be implemented? It is actually on the alternative two slide, if you can go back to show that slide. One more, there we are. Thanks for showing that. Oh, go forward one. Yeah, thanks. So Lynette, can you read what part of the slide is the answer here? Oh, sure. I'll put it in the chat, but it's 30 CFR part 250 subpart Q 1728 through 1731. I'll, I'll do that so somebody could copy and paste it. That's a mouthful. Okay. Thank <laughs> you so much, Lynette. Sure. Okay. Um, and then it looks like, and just I'll just confirm that we answered that question for the person who asked that. And then there's another question that I see here as we scroll to our question and answer slide here. Um, will an updated analysis of suitable and available Jones Act vessels required for decommissioning be made in the final edition of the PEIS? And say thank you for that comment. We will be sure to look at that and provide appropriate updates or revisions to the final EIS. Thanks. Thank you, Rick. And then another question here, will the slides be available for download at a future date? They will, we'll be posting actually a recording of this video. So the recording will be available after it's made 508 compliant. So it might be a couple weeks. Great, thank you, Lynette. And I'll pause to see if any questions come in related to the environmental scoping process. And I do want to note that we've seen some questions come in that are unrelated to the environmental scoping process, but Boehm and Bessie will take note and um, be able to respond to those at a future date as well. Okay. I'll do a brief pause to see if there's any other questions, but I think we're um, on track to move on to our public comment session. So if we can head to the next slide here. And the slide after this. Wonderful. So we're in our public comment opportunity. Again, we want to thank folks for joining us today and getting to this point. I'll go to the next slide here. Uh, just as a process, uh, if you would like to provide oral public comment today, you can use the raise hand feature at the bottom of your screen. Um, I will mind the queue and call on folks in the order in which their hands have been raised. Uh, please speak clearly and into the microphone, say your name and affiliation. And um, when you're done speaking, you can mute and we'll also mute you as well. On the next slide, there's just some specific instructions on how we'll be doing it today. So we haven't had any pre-registered comments today. So we'll be going in the order of hands that were raised. Um, we will have three minutes. Public comment will be recorded. Um, we ask that folks be respectful of everyone's time and opportunity to speak today. So we will start with our first public comment and I'll read, the, I'll read two names so that folks know the order um, that we will be going in. So the first person will be Richard Charter, the second Kristen Hislop. So Richard, um, I will unmute you here. And you, if you can say your name and affiliation, you have three minutes. Thank you. My name is Richard Charter with the Ocean Foundation. Thank you for providing this opportunity to comment on the necessity of full decommissioning of spent rigs and other infrastructure on the California coast 
and the present legal mandate for full decommissioning in various contexts. We would first like to request an extension of the public comment period by a full 45 days. Second, we ask that the agencies of jurisdiction fully analyze impacts associated with alternatives two, three, and four, which allow oil companies to leave contaminated shell and debris mounds on the seafloor, creating both safety and environmental hazards. We have some experience with these problems here in California, as you know, with issues that led to an extensive legal record that should be cited in the PEIS. How will leaving pipelines on the seafloor impact water quality, for example, during flushing and long-term safety? We point to the recent Long Beach pipeline incident as just one example of a lack of monitoring and failure to maintain safety in pipeline operations, monitoring, and maintenance. The PEIS needs to analyze the feasibility and effectiveness of the proposed mitigation measures. We will need to see a full population level analysis of impacts to biological productivity for each option. We need an unbiased consideration of impacts from invasive species at platforms that are not fully removed, particularly in light of clear evidence of platforms providing a migratory pathway for invasives in the Gulf of Mexico. Please provide an objective analysis of the chain of liability that will accrue to the state of California and its taxpayers with each scenario. Finally, we will be submitting more comprehensive written comments shortly. And again, thank you for taking public comment into consideration. Thank you, Richard, for your public comment today. We'll pause this timer and then I'll turn it over to Kristen Hislop. And I'll just pause too to see if anyone else would like to provide public comment, you can raise your hand. Uh, so Kristen, we will unmute you. If you can say your name and affiliation, you have three minutes. There we go. Thank you. Kristen Hislop, I am the Senior Director of the Marine Program at the Environmental Defense Center in Santa Barbara. And we are um, very happy to have this uh, preliminary environmental impact statement in front of us um, and very happy that it's a programmatic um, EAS. So thank you very much for that. My first request is uh, another reiteration of our of what Richard just mentioned and what we've sent in uh, written comments to uh, extend the comment period. This has been a very long time coming to look at the cumulative impacts of platform removal in Southern California and we've waited a long time. So there's a lot of interest, even if there was only three requests, one of those did have probably a dozen NGOs uh, signed on to it. So um, quite a few of us are really hoping for an extension so we have time to um, do a really thorough review. So thank you very much for considering that request. Um, I, I definitely appreciate, obviously we're still looking at the, at the report, but I definitely appreciate the very comprehensive look at the affected environment. Um, it's clear a lot of work went into that, so thank you very much. We were happy to see temporary and longer-term impacts of alternatives, though I do have some questions about longer than the 30 to 50-year time scale, especially related to shell mounds and what will happen to the habitat value of those as they lose uh, contribution of new shells and become covered in mud. We've seen with the um, shell mounds off of Carpinteria where platforms were moved in the 90s, as early as 2001, a State Lands Commission environmental review showed that species richness and abundance um, had gone down and that habitat value was just likely to continue to, to decrease over time. And that wasn't uh, reflected in the PEIS as far as I've seen so far. Um, so that was looking at maybe a 30 year time scale and, and we're interested in a little bit longer time scale than that. Um, we're also curious about how under the, the current regime, fishing is restricted around the platforms, but once removal takes place under alternative two or three, that may, uh, one of the benefits that the EIS uh, noted was the ability for recreational fishing. And so what is the next, what's the impact of fishing and um, productivity of these structures that didn't that doesn't appear to be analyzed so kind of taking that the next step what happens if if these areas are um, both remain and are then fished um, so that's one of our questions and uh, running out of time here but we're also looking at uh, 
some of the environmental consequence section included threatened and endangered species for invertebrates and fishes, but not under marine mammals or marine bird section. So curious about what that might look like um, in the final. Hopefully there's some uh, inclusion of more threatened and endangered species that may be affected. Um, yeah, so we'll, we will submit more comprehensive comments. And again, just thank you so much for the time and effort and all the studies you've done on this issue. We're very appreciative and um, look forward to commenting and hopefully having a little more time to do so. So thank you very much. Great, thank you, Kristen, for your comment. Uh, the next person I'd like to welcome is Julia Chun here. So Julia, um, I will unmute you now. Um, and if you can unmute yourself, you'll have um, three, if you can say your name and affiliation, you'll have three minutes for public comment. Good morning, thank you. I'm Julia Chen here, and I'm working with the Surfrider Foundation on this issue. I'm also a resident of San Diego County. Um, as you know, the Surfrider Foundation is a grassroots environmental organization dedicated to the protection and enjoyment of the world's oceans, waves, and beaches for all people through a powerful activist network. We actually have 20 uh, chapters within the state of California, and many of our members and chapters have expressed support and interest in this very important topic. Um, many of us are still making our way through the document, and since it is so foundational and additional documents will be tiered off of it, we are excited that it's out, but would like to request the full extension of 45 days to uh, make it sure it's as meaningful um, and comprehensive as possible. Many of my comments have been touched on already by the previous speakers. Um, with that, I'll just add two brief remarks. Um, so if the first, if the top 100 feet of the platform under the surface tends to be the most productive, if the top 85 feet is removed for safety, how will that affect um, marine productivity? And then also, I believe um, additional analysis is needed around leaving the pipelines in place. Um, and the safety and how that will impact water quality and environmental impacts. Um, and if you can cite any studies as to how that infrastructure performs in the long term, you know, over decades um, and past its intended life. Um, with that, I will keep making my way through the document and appreciate your time today and for taking my comments. Thank you, Julia, for your comments today. I'd like to pause and see if there's anyone else who would like to provide comment. All right, I see Molly. Uh, Molly, I'm going to unmute you now. If you can say your name and your affiliation, you have three minutes. Hi, my name is Molly Troop. I'm a science and policy associate with Santa Barbara Channel Keeper, a nonprofit located in Santa Barbara. Um, thank you for this comprehensive document. We are making our way through it and we'll be submitting comprehensive comments as well. Um, just today, I wanted to reiterate the request um, for a full 45 day extension. Um, we had signed on to a group letter um, with a number of other organizations. So we just really wanted to um, reiterate that need and request for additional time to um, be able to really um, make our way through the document and provide thorough um, comments on this. So thank you very much. Thank you, Molly, for your comment. Uh, the next person we have is Brian, uh, Brian Von Herzen. So Brian, I'm going to unmute you now. If you can say your name and your affiliation. Uh, you have three minutes. And Brian, you should be un unmuted on, on our end. And Brian, if you're speaking, we can't hear you. So one of our, um, our tech team will reach out to see if we can help troubleshoot your mic. So while we're waiting for Brian, um, I'll pause to see if there's anyone else who would like to I found it. Uh, so it's working better. Yes, I had to enable a browser permission. Thank All you right. very much. Uh, Dr. Brian Von Herson, uh, Executive Director at the Climate Foundation. First of all, thank you very much for the presentation today. We'd like to second the request to have a 45-day extension period on this PEIS. 
Uh, in addition, we'd like to um, ask whether there are uh, proposals being considered to have the upper jacket be relocated somewhere perhaps within the Santa Barbara Channel to continue to provide ecosystem services. As mentioned in a previous question, some of those critical ecosystem services are in the upper jacket, let's say the top 85 feet, and if those were relocated perhaps to shallower waters, they could provide uh, recreational diving opportunities, ecosystem services, uh, possibly sustainable fishing, um, and uh, would like to understand if those uh, are perhaps uh, possible options that can be put on the spectrum. In addition, um, since these ecosystem services are substantial and profound, I wonder if there might be any exploration of having these artificial reefs protected against overfishing, both the uh, lower jacket, which could provide deep diving opportunities, at depths greater than 85 feet, and also the upper jacket, which might be placed in shallower waters and provide uh, recreational uh, diving and snorkeling opportunities in shallower waters. This seems to be a distinct um, ecosystem service uh, opportunity, something that could be protected against uh, overfishing or other depletion and provide ongoing ecosystem services to critical kelp forest and other ecosystems that are being um, damaged by climate disruption and thus could provide a significant benefit to the public. So I'd be interested in any uh, comments and uh, suggestions in that regard and exploration of such proposals, if there are any such proposals on the table. Thank you very much. Great, thank you, Brian, for your comment. I'm glad we were able to hear you today. Okay. Um, I'll pause again to see if there's anyone else who would like to provide comment. Okay, folks, a couple minutes. All right, there are currently no hands raised, but again, we'll wait a few more moments to see if anyone else is thinking through their comment or would like to provide comment. So I'm seeing no hands raised here. Um, so I will move us on to our next steps. And just to let folks know, we'll be on here until uh, 1 p.m. Uh, for anyone who would like to provide oral public comment. But for folks who have provided that comment, um, we, will, um, we will move on just to, to as a reminder of how we can continue um, to receive your comments and continue to provide input. So Rick, I'll turn it over to you for closing remarks. Great, thank you, Jenna. <clears throat> well, once again, thank you all for being here today, for uh, listening in on the presentation about the background on the programmatic documents um, and for providing us with uh, the thoughts that you have today. And I will uh, acknowledge we heard from many of you today as we have in the formal written process, uh, asking about an extension of the comment period. And I can just assure you today that the department is considering that very seriously. So um, um, that uh, uh, request is heard. So thank you for that. And thank you for the other comments that you submitted, including uh, all of your commitments to submit written comments uh, forthcoming. So we look forward to seeing those. As I said in the introduction, it's all in the spirit of helping us uh, revise the document uh, for release of a final to provide clarifications and any edits um, that make it a better document. So it provides a solid foundation for consideration of future decommissioning applications by Bessie. So all of these things that you brought up today and in the comments that you're gonna submit are going to uh, advance us in that regard. So thank you so much for being here. I appreciate it. And uh, cheers for me. Thanks, Jenna. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Ben. 
And I'm going to have us go to the next slide quickly, just as a reminder. And one slide after this, Lynette's information is in the chat. We can add that again. And I think we have another note on how to provide public comment if you aren't providing it orally today. Uh, the Federal Register in writing an email. And as we discussed today, comments are due currently by December 12th. Um, and I will just um, note that we will be on for the next hour or so, and we'll be on until uh, one o'clock for folks who do want to provide oral public comment. Um, and so we'll turn our videos off and our sound, but if you would like to provide comment, I'll just be watching for folks who are joining or are raising their hand. For our phone call-in users, you can dial star nine um, to provide public comment as well. Um, but we will end the presentation here and come back on as there are if there are folks who would like to provide um, comment who join later. And for, I do see just before folks leave, I do see our phone call-in user um, has their hand raised. And so I'm gonna unmute you here. And I think um, if your number ends in 9084, if you dial star six on your phone, um, you can uh, be unmuted. Yes, Wonderful. hello, can you hear me? I can, and if you can say your name and affiliation, uh, sure. you have three minutes. Okay, thanks. Um, so my name is Ryan Davis, and uh, I am the founder and creative director of America's Green Corps. And uh, we are working for our organization's pilot project to transform an oil platform, a non-operational oil platform, into a green lighthouse. Um, so it's green in that it would be powered by the sun, the wind, and the sea. And uh, this would create a, a great model um, to be studied for how to generate energy um, at the site. And that energy could be moved ashore. So any excess energy beyond the, the need for um, for the lighthouse for, for sustainment systems could be you know fed back into the grid via the cable. We're looking at um, platform Holly, but we're not necessarily you know married to the idea of platform Holly. And we think that this is a great seed to plan people's minds and how we could recycle some of the oil infrastructure and you know repurpose it for these uh, renewable energy uses. Um, additionally, the substructure which uh, of Holly, which has tons of marine biology attached to it. Um, if the platform was to be removed, unfortunately, that marine biology would go away. And, um, you know, that marine biology filters and oxygenates the water and serves a function um, to improve water quality. Um, and so we think that um, if we were able to preserve, um, you know, just one of the platforms um, to create this, this energy model, um, that it would serve both, um, you know, energy research, um, which could benefit the public good and actually could help in the decision-making process going forward for other platforms, not just here in California, but maybe even around the world. And then also it provided a significant opportunity for, um, you know, aquaculture research to take place. Um, and we may even be able to enhance um, the fishery by recycling, you know, these platforms in, in this manner. So America's Green Corps is, is working on this. Um, we also we're gifted a vertical column wind power generator patent, which we would have integrated into the green lighthouse. Um, and just to reiterate how the, the energy component would work out is it would be powered by the sun, the wind and the sea. This would create an opportunity for um, the best um, energy providers that work in those spaces to showcase their technology. And if in the future we were able to have this turned into some sort of eco monument, people could, you know, visit this, learn more about how California took an oil platform and turned it into a site that not only created renewable energy, but even a food source, perhaps in the future. So um, I'm really looking forward to working with the other groups here in the area on this project and, um, and hope that there might be some opportunities to work with BOEM and any of the other um, groups who have a long-term interest in uh, offshore energy. Thanks so much, and uh, look forward to hearing from you. If you're interested, you can contact me at uh, Ryan at Project First Light. We also have a lab group webpage, which is projectfirstlight.net. Thanks. Great. Thank you, Ryan, for your comment today. And I'll pause uh, to see, I, I thought I saw another hand to come up too, so I'll pause to see if anyone else has public comment they, they'd like to provide, um, oral public comment today. Oh, 
Okay, so we're going to go back to the slide um, with how to provide comment um, outside of this meeting. And I'll just be watching for raised hands and anyone who joins will welcome them to provide comment as well. Um, so here we are. We'll go off video, but we will be here um, listening and waiting for other folks who would like to provide comment. Again, we'll be on till 1 p.m. Thank you, everyone.